Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome um, to today's webinar. Um, my name is Sean McKinnon. I'm joined here by Charles Haynes. Um, today's going to be the first in a series of webinars that we run specifically for some of our banking and finance contacts. Um, and we're going to try and give you some real life insights into what we've been seeing in discussions with our own clients and contacts. I'm trying to help you understand a little bit today about what we've seen from those customers and, and talk you through some of the phases that we've distinct phases we've seen develop over the last couple of over the last couple of um, months. So look, uh, just by way of formal introduction, um, as I said, I'm Sean McKinnon, I'm a partner here in the advisory practice. Um, I specialise in doing restructuring and corporate finance work, in particular um, food and agribusiness. Um, although over the last couple of months, I've been spending a lot of time dealing with restructuring related issues across a real broad section of industries, as we'll talk about shortly. Charles, do you wanna? Uh, Charles Haynes, also from the restructuring team. Uh, like Sean and a lot of in the restructuring team, I spent the last couple of months uh, working with clients across the firm uh, through our business services and audit divisions, uh, working through the impacts of COVID-19 uh, on their businesses. All right, so what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to walk through what just happened. Um, for anybody that's been in the accounting and finance industry, um, I'm pretty sure you'll agree that what we've seen over the last couple of months has been quite extraordinary um, and certainly not like anything that I've seen in my 25 years in the industry. Then we're going to take a bit of a walk through time and we're going to do that through five case studies. So we're going to talk to you about five particular businesses that we've been dealing with, um, all of which are actually clients of the firm and are managed by different partners within the firm of our business, but who engaged with us during this period um, in relation to some of the concerns they've had. And while we're gonna talk about these five businesses in particular, we're also gonna have a bit more of a, a discussion around what we've seen generally. Um, and I'll make the point that although the case studies that we're gonna go through today are case studies that deal with businesses that have been negatively impacted, um, there have been plenty of businesses in our own client base that have actually done quite well out of this. There's also been a number of businesses that haven't really seen too much impact. Um, but given the, the attendees on today's call and given obviously what's topical for you, we thought we'd focus on some of those that had felt some pressure. We're then going to look into the future and give you our views on, on some things that we think might be occurring as, as time passes. So we might just jump over Charles. All right, so what just happened? Um, you can see there at the top of the screen, we've identified three distinct phases. And in these different boxes that you can see on the screen, we've tried to set out some of the key milestones that occurred in each of those phases that really defined those phases. Now, we've talked about there being a panic phase. We then moved into an information overload phase, which are the orange boxes. And we're now in what we call a realisation stage. Now, let's talk about what we saw in each of those very briefly before we go into it in a bit more detail. The panic phase was really what we saw when around about sort of mid-March, early March, we started to see um, the impacts of COVID-19 impacting our own economy. So while we had seen the, the oil lords, for example, start dropping from about mid-Feb, and we've been seeing reports coming out of China about what was happening there, we'd seen isolated instances of particular businesses that had problem either getting supply into or out of China in particular. But as time moved on, we started to see COVID-19 spread into other countries. And, and then it slowly started to seep into Australia. And it was around about the 12th of March when we really saw things take off. This was when our own business started to go into working from home. A lot of other businesses also started doing work from home. And there was a cascading of effects that flew on, that flowed on from that in terms of the amount of business that was going on um, because people were just in their homes. Um, then the government started releasing these different social distancing rules and by 22 March we started to see these widespread closures. And what we'll talk about in a minute is the discussions we were having in that panic phase were very different to what we're having now and there was some real concern amongst our clients. We then moved into almost simultaneously with the closures, the government started releasing these stimulus packages and, and there was this almost daily updates from the Prime Minister and Premiers of the different states which was taking us through different measures and different restrictions almost back to forth. And what we're seeing in that phase is we've, we've called this the information overload phase because there was so much information coming to businesses 
that they were really struggling to understand what it all meant. And they were sort of playing catch up. There was, you know, LinkedIn was just awash with updates, emails, webinars. There was a lot of information in the press, social media, trying to explain what all these measures meant. But by the time we got to the end of, sort of around about the 7th of April, um, most of those measures had largely been exposed. And the big ones being JobKeeper um, and the Tenant Landlord Code of Conduct, they'd been released. And we then sort of saw businesses move into what we're now calling this realisation phase. And that realisation phase was where businesses first started to understand what things really look like for them over the next couple of months. It was the first time that they could realistically do a cash flow that actually had some sense of um, normality to it. And, and it would be a new normality, not a new previous normality, but they could predict with some degree of, I guess, some degree of accuracy, what was gonna be happening over the next couple of months. Now, Charles, if we just push forward. Now, I just wanted to also talk about the fact that um, if we look at those three phases of this, that I've identified, let's look at that in the context of what happened with the All Lords. Um, and I said earlier, you can see there that the All Lords peaked on 20 Feb. And if we think about what was actually happening then, this is as we started to see the impacts of COVID-19 slowly seep into Australia. So we'd known that that was in the, in the world and we'd seen some impact on really small parts of the economy. But it was around the end of Feb that we started to see this was coming to Australia. And we said that panic phase started around about the 12th of March. Um, and really, you can see there that the oil lords continued to plummet till the 23rd of March. And that was the day in which the government started releasing all of its stimulus measures, its major stimulus measures. And, and then they started to provide a lot of help and support um, at the same time, it wasn't just the government releasing these measures. There were other stakeholders, um, primarily the banks, that were also releasing a series of measures related to how they would support their clients. And that started to really um, improve the mood from the clients that we were talking to. And then as we got into the sort of early April, we started to see this realisation. I think you can see in the All Lords chart here that while we had a slight climb back up, once we got to that realisation phase, we've now been covering off this fairly, um, I guess, this plateau where business is sort of just trying to figure out what it looks like going forward. They've got some level of confidence around the short term, but we'll talk about later on exactly how long that confidence is likely to exist for. Charles, if you just want to flick over. And then I just wanted to contrast this again to um, the medical side of it. And you can see that again, we've, we've identified those same time periods, the panic phase, the information overload phase, and the realisation phase. And while they were economically linked, um, you can also see that they are linked in terms of medical cases too. The panic phase was also as we were seeing the worst of it. We were seeing this daily increase. So we not only had, and it's a you know, chicken and egg, I guess, as to how these all came about, but I suspect um, as we were seeing these cases drive up, we were also at the same time seeing the economic impacts. And once they started to peak, we started to get all the measures to close the economy and to also support the economy. Um, that then resulted in the medical side of things starting to come down in terms of new cases, um, which has given us confidence not only economically, but I guess um, from a social perspective, which flows on to economics. So that was all I wanted to cover, I guess, on what just happened, really to give some context um, to how we're going to talk through the rest of this, this presentation. And we're going to now look at these three phases that we've identified, and we're going to explain to you what we were seeing in those, in those particular phases, and we're going to talk about five case studies in particular around what we saw in five specific businesses in different industries to give you some insights to what they were thinking, how they were responding to this, and where they're at today. Thanks, Sean. Uh, the first stage uh, that we're going to discuss is the panic phase, uh, which we're calling uncertainty and rapid change. Panic and confusion is the key marks of this phase. Uh, at this stage, uh, businesses were very unsure in relation to what was happening. Uh, you had customers doing panic buying at grocery stores. Directors were calling their financial advisors, uh, trying to get a handle on, on what was happening. Um, and there was a high level of uncertainty in the market. Uh, the discussions that we were having internally with partners in other service areas were around safe harbour, directors' risks of insolvent trading, and possible restructuring options which were available, which at that stage we were talking about the benefits of a, a voluntary administration deed of company arrangement. 
Industries that were being impacted were tourism and retail with the close of international borders and later state borders, uh, hospitality, uh, cafes and clubs closing, sports and entertainment, uh, and also education. So we're now going to just talk you through these five different case studies. And you can see that we're talking about a medical practice, a licensed club, a not-for-profit, a retail, and a, an education business. Um, and in this panic phase, if we talk through each of these and what they were thinking, um, the medical practice, a little bit of background, it's a specialised medical services, so think specialised specialist practice. There's 10 doctors in a city. Um, at, the, at this stage in sort of early to mid-March, they hadn't actually seen a revenue reduction yet, but they had seen their forward bookings come off materially. Um, and there was generally this overarching panic and they had reached out to us about the concept of safe harbour. Um, and I guess that's interesting because the reality is a week before that, they felt they were pretty much okay. Um, and we're trying to demonstrate here how quickly people started to worry and, and panic, I guess, before a lot of those positive measures were released. If I then contrast that with the licensed club, um, this is a regional RSL club, quite a large club, 200 staff. Um, at, the time of the, at the time of the shutdown, they had about 500,000 in cash reserves. Um, they went from reduced trading for a brief period to being completely shut down. Um, and their first discussion with us was also around safe harbour. Uh, not-for-profit, uh, it was a national not-for-profit organisation uh, with a mix of uh, full-time employees and, and volunteers. Uh, actually had a very strong uh, cash reserve position. They traditionally operate with a 12 months cash reserve position. Uh, the board got on the front foot very early. Um, they told the CEO that notwithstanding COVID-19, they didn't want to see their cash reserves uh, drop below nine months. Um, and the CEO got in contact with us in relation to um, tax and strategic cash flow advice. Um, the other one was a retail business. This was actually a manufacturing business as well, technically. They do their own baking and sell confectionery through to retail cafes. Um, they had initially tried to keep their stores open. One was in the CBD and one was in uh, West End from memory. And that particular business, um, while it was trying to stay open, it wasn't forced to shut under any of the restrictions. Um, it just saw such a reduction in patronage. There was almost as to literally zero sales from on site as literally the CBD and other major um, hubs, community hubs, just disappeared of people. Um, and ultimately they had to close their retail stores um, and they originally came to us again seeking safe harbour. So again, a bit of this flavour that things changed really rapidly and the first, the first discussion we started having with people was really around um, where they were impacted was potentially solvency risk and, and how they could deal with that to stay alive. And the last one is, uh, was actually an English language school which uh, relies solely on international students, uh, which was significantly impacted once Orders closed. Uh, they presented primarily through classes, not online. Uh, they immediately stood down their staff and, and got in contact with us with regarding a potential safe harbour engagement. And we're also uh, considering a formal employment because they couldn't see a future uh, without the international students attending attending classes. Moving on to the information overload phase. As Sean's touched on already, this was the phase where we really started seeing rapid government response, uh, both, in the, both in relation to stimulus packages and also changing legislation. Uh, multiple stimulus packages were, were announced, uh, both by the federal government and the state government. Uh, the banks um, announced support for its customers in relation to uh, financial support for deferrals of interest. Also, the ATO uh, got on the front foot as well, also talking about being, up, being able to delay payments and same with state payroll tax. At this stage, the conversations we were having with partners were in relation to getting in contact with stakeholders and taking advantage of those opportunities and also talking with landlords and talking about what options are available on pay, making payments for those rents. At this stage, there was a lot of work going into building cash flows and understanding the cash position and how much cash burn the business was undertaking. Yeah, so uh, and I think it's worth 
highlighting again, as we moved into this second phase, this information overload phase, we also saw a real shift, as Charles has mentioned, in terms of you know, our clients and customers, that they weren't starting to panic so much. They got over that initial concern and they were now starting to say, okay, well, all these measures are out here. Um, let's think about how that's gonna, gonna work through. Um, there has been a little bit of the shock had sort of passed and we were now starting to look at you know, how do we actually move forward. Now, if I look at this in the form of these case studies, we go back to our medical practice. Um, so um, it's interesting for these guys. So they, by this stage, they'd actually start to see their revenue reduction materialize. So it was now real for them. Um, and they'd seen, you know, within the space of a week or two, their revenue had dropped by about 30%. Um, and I woke up one morning to have an email that said, hey, we've had a board meeting last night and we'd like to contact you and we want to talk about whether or not we need to appoint an administrator. Um, so even though we sort of passed that panic phase, um, these guys are still seeing the fact that hey, well, we're actually really seeing a significant downturn and we're not sure what this is going to look like. But around shortly after that, then we saw the JobKeeper details released and then the tenant and the landlord code of conduct was released, which really shifted the dial for them. Um, and we had a, a fairly long board meeting where we talked through with, with all of the directors um, exactly what the cash flow could look like tried to help them understand that they weren't in fact insolvent, that they could trade through for this period. Um, and they got some real comfort around that and they started to, I guess, get the resolve to move forward, um, which was really positive to see. The license club we talked about, that's a different story. Um, unfortunately for them, so they've been able to reduce their cash burn to about $30,000 a month. Um, and they'd done that by obviously standing down their staff. They had, um, stop trading, but there were certain costs that you just can't remove. Um, costs such as a couple of key staff, um, paying your insurance, security, your fire costs, um, and, and other bits and pieces that they just weren't able to deal with. What they had been able to do though is their bank had given them a six month deferral of all repayments. Um, they had deferred all rent for six months on the basis that they couldn't physically pay any of it. Um, they had identified they were eligible for JobKeeper, um, but problematically for them, given the number of staff they had who'd been stood down that they weren't paying, they then had to then go and find the funding to be able to pay that up front before it would be reimbursed by the government. And those payments, I think, are coming into bank accounts either this week or next week. Um, so they then had to, to tap their bank for some help to be able to fund those, those JobKeeper payments. Um, but effectively, that club, at this point in time, um, They've reduced all the costs they can, but they are very much in a holding pattern waiting for the economy to restart and their business to open again. Moving on to our not-for-profit. Uh, they, they stood down staff very early in the piece. Uh, as touched on earlier, they were fortunate in relation to they had a large volunteer base that they're, they're able to leverage on. Uh, they engaged with, with their advisors, in particular tax advice around JobKeeper. Uh, there are some very special provisions in the JobKeeper that affect the not-for-profit space. So they they worked out whether they were eligible for JobKeeper and they were doing multiple cash flow scenarios. So I think they had at one stage four different cash flows going through different modelling of uh, what their engagement looked like with various stakeholders through sponsors and landlords. Uh, so they, at the moment they're running multiple cash flow scenarios as to what their future looks like. And we think about the retail business, they're actually a really good news story. So while their um, retail outlets were in fact closed, they pivoted to online sales really effectively. Um, they did have an online presence before this all occurred, but they hadn't really generated a lot of sales out, but mainly due to a lack of focus. Um, but they quickly pivoted to that. They started a real push around social media. Um, they connected through to some of the delivery sites like Deliveroo, which is a bit of a process to get hooked up to. Um, but they managed to actually see, a they saw a reduction of about 40% in sales, but had they have not shifted to online, model, it would have been closer to 100%. Um, so they really did actually do some really positive changes in their business in this period. And as the landlord uh, tenant code of conduct came out, they reached out to us and now wanted us to help them in terms of how do they manage those negotiations. And where we got to effectively was um, that the best way to move forward for this particular business was to look at a month to month scenario. So we encouraged them to be really transparent about um, what their numbers were saying and, and what the impact for them was. To understand that all of the different parties in supply chains need to take a little bit of pain um, and that all of the parties in supply chains 
are going to be pretty reasonable in terms of making sure that everybody survives. So with that aim in mind, that particular business went to their landlord um, and was able to negotiate what would effectively become a month to month arrangement whereby each month they could demonstrate their financial results, show the impact it had for them, show how much they were actually physically able to pay. So there's a lot of transparency here that probably wouldn't normally go on, but it was received very positively by the landlords. And our English language skill, uh, they reached agreements with their stakeholders. Uh, they stood down staff, um, spoke to their respective landlords, uh, but their primary cash burn was in relation to student refunds. So students who weren't able to attend campuses were, were getting cash refunds. So they sat down with the regulator and clarified what their actual position was. And there was a policy change where rather than providing cash refunds, they were providing credits for future semesters, which uh, stabilised their cash position. Um, surprisingly enough, they still were having students uh, sign up um, and they pivoted to an online delivery of courses where, where possible. Uh, so that really stabilised their, their cash burn position. I was going to say, one thing that's probably worth noting in this phase is that while some businesses were good at it, we also saw a real lack of forward cash flow forecasting. Um, and we were encouraging people that, hey, you've got to build these forecasts. You've got, you've got to be really critical about them. But um, what we saw was, I guess, a reluctant in practice for businesses consistently to put in place a robust cash flow forecasting tool. And moving on to our third phase, which is the realisation phase. And this is the phase where we believe most businesses are currently sitting. Um, there has been some stability or the new normal um, seems to have set in. Uh, JobKeeper in particular has really um, had an impact now with businesses have uh, met those payments for the first, first month. And now as Sean touched on, those first payments are, are coming in this week and next week uh, from the ATO. So that, that, that really has seen a stabilisation in relation to businesses. That a lot of them have been in contact with key suppliers, key customers, and, and understand their, those supply and customer chains a little better. And they have a feeling that they understand what their business looks like for the next few months. Um, however, where a lot of businesses haven't got to yet is looking beyond that and you know, what, what's beyond the next couple of months um, and what happens past um, September when the government protections that have been put in place um, come to an end. So if we move on to our um, on to our different case studies again, so we're now in this realisation phase where people, as Charles has said, have started to get some confidence to forecast over the next few months. Um, our medical practice, pleased to say, they now had a stable forecast. In fact, they were pretty good in terms of building a really robust forecast. Um, they now sort of started to see their revenue had flattened out. So it had stopped falling and they'd reached a new level of consistency, which allowed them the opportunity to, to forecast with a bit of confidence around that side of it. They'd also been able to negotiate with landlords and they had an understanding of what the JobKeeper payments would be, et cetera. So these things were now built into a forecast. Um, and what we were seeing was that those directors were quite, now had some confidence that they weren't insolvent and that they could at least trade through in the short term. Um, not indefinitely though, I should probably make the point. So once we get post September, and September is important, and we'll talk about this why in a minute, but in short, September is where a lot of different measures expire. Um, once we get past that, um, they will still need to have another good look at, at where they're going, um, and it will be determined as to how they go after that, based on how their trading has come back in short. Now our license club, again, this is a really difficult one and there's a lot of pubs and clubs that are in this exact same situation right now. So th there's obviously no end in sight for them on the shutdown. I, I have seen some reports of possibly early June, um, but look, the reality is even if they open you know, clubs and restaurants in early June, there'll still be social distancing measures and, and there's also a question as to how much the, the wider community is actually going to um, patronise those particular places while the COVID-19 virus still is in the community. Um, so their issue becomes that they've only got so much working capital at the moment and that is being ex extinguished bit by bit the longer this goes on. Um, unfortunately for them, uh, they've only got so much in terms of capital in the bank. So they're going to have to find an alternative solution at some point in the near future if trading doesn't resume for them. And that alternative solution might be really tough. Effectively, they're going to have to find some more funding from somewhere and that it'll probably be either their bank 
In fact, it will almost certainly be their bank that they have to tap, I suspect. Uh, my not-for-profit, there is, they are still having a cash burn, but it's uh, well within their board limits that were imposed. Uh, they're in constant engagement with their stakeholders, confirming scheduled sponsorship and grant income, and, and these increased updating to the board in relation to how COVID-19 is impacting the business. Um, interestingly enough, they're already having discussions internally in relation to what post-COVID-19 looks like for their business, um, particularly how they reposition themselves in, in the market. Um, our retail business continues to be a positive story. Um, so they're trading through relatively relatively well at the moment. Um, they're not making a lot of money, but they are able to continue to trade without going backwards. Um, they're going to accumulate a little bit of debt, which they're going to have to pay at the end of this period. Um, but what that looks like depends on what the, how quickly their trading returns. And this will be the story for a lot of businesses, especially in that retail sector. Is um, Right now, it's all about managing your cash flow and trying to get through this initial period. But whether or not you can um, recover from, I guess, the debt position that you're going to take on at the end of this, um, and that'll be effectively, um, it's not relevant for these guys, but if you have, in fact, push, push back some of your bank repayments, what is relevant for these guys will be some um, landlord, some rent, which will have accumulated. Um, so that their position will be a little bit uncertain until we know what that trading return looks like. But for now, they've actually demonstrated that they can that they can trade through reasonably well. In our English language school, uh, they continue to deliver their content online. Um, the directors really engaging with other parties in the, in the industry, um, which there aren't that many. Um, the business still has has cash reserves, um, lower than traditionally. Um, however. Feedback is that that puts them in a, in a much stronger place than others uh, in, in that industry. And the director's already considering looking at what opportunities that leads for for post COVID 19 in, in relation to whether there's an industry rationalisation possible uh, given the state of other businesses in the sector. All right, so now we just want to turn our attention um, before we finish up to talk a little bit about what we see in the future. So first of all, let's reflect on the fact that um, there have been a lot of businesses that have actually benefited from this. And I won't go through the list here, they're fairly well exposed, but certainly we've seen in our own client base, a number of businesses report really positive trading outcomes because of the industries they're in. And as I said at the start of this, there's also a lot of businesses in our client base that haven't been impacted at all. Um, so it certainly isn't all doom and gloom, but what we are seeing is probably uh, and this will go forward, is a bit of a, a divergence between the haves and the have-nots, so to speak. Um, those that haven't been impacted um, will be fine, but those that have been impacted, I think what we'll see over the next sort of six months or so is that they will be impacted quite hard. Um, we've talked about a few here which we think will bounce back in a reasonable time, so healthcare, um, you know, landlords, Professional services, you know, our own business and other accountants and lawyers have obviously um, taken some measures to reduce costs during the period, but we would expect that those that those um, initial downturns would probably turn around once the business starts to get largely back to, to normal. Those that are going to be in a longer, have you know, some longer term issues, obviously, are retail, who was, which was under pressure prior to this, and the massive shift to online um, sales is really going to be interesting to see how how that impacts retail going forward. Um, hospitality, this is the one that everybody is is really looking at, I guess. Um, it's going to be very difficult from what we're seeing for hospitality to return to a normal you know, in a short period of time. Um, and there is going to be some real pain in our view around hospitality. The same will be for entertainment and tourism. Hotels will also um, struggle. Transport, um, obviously airlines, we've seen some, you know, some big issues happening in airlines, um, but it'll be the same with buses and, and other met methods of transportation that see people um, typically in close contact with each other. Education where there's an exposure to international students is obviously going to hit hard. And, and property construction is the other one that's interesting. So what we're hearing from in property construction is right now they haven't been impacted. They're largely pretty busy. But that pipeline and new work coming down the line is really starting to um, is really starting to close up. Just flick over there, Charles. So I just wanted to make the point here that 
we have actually seen some of these impacted industries already start to um, uh, start to feel the pain. We've seen a couple of high profile failures. I would make the point though that I think a lot of these businesses have probably other than Techfront, we're already under pressure going into this. Um, Techfront supplied the sports and entertainment industry as I understand it. Um, so the closure of a lot of the sporting codes really impacted them. Um, but I think we'll also see a scenario where COVID-19 might also be a convenient opportunity for um, directors to, to put up their hand and use the administration process um, where they may have been in some difficulty or had a business model that wasn't 100% or, or a balance sheet that was in a difficult position prior to COVID-19. Um, this will sort of be a combination of the straw that broke the camel's back and an opportunity to sort of blame it on COVID-19 for some businesses. Um, we do feel though that there's a long way to go. Um, now, obviously I'm not a medical professional, um, but I've been watching like everybody else, the, the communications that have been coming out from the Prime Minister and the state governments. And there's a fairly consistent message that the easing of restrictions will be gradual. And, and while COVID-19 remains a material risk in the community and it's out there, um, even as we start to re ease restrictions, there's still going to be the risk of specific businesses being impacted. Um, and we've seen that in the last few days, we see with the Meatworks out of Melbourne, where they had, I've commented on in the slides there, I think there was, I think there was 19 particular cases when we wrote these slides, but as of today, there's 32, just in that one cluster. And then that business has been closed, um, and I'm not sure how long it'll be closed for, but there's a risk that we see that even though particular industries more broadly might start to return to some normality, um, there is also going to be the risk that any particular business, if it does in fact receive a cluster of cases or an infection within its own staffing, that that business in isolation could be materially impacted in a really short period of time. There's obviously some risk around consumer behaviour. So even as restrictions ease and businesses become open, um, it's clearly unknown how quickly people will start to patronise those businesses and, and how they will start to how they will start to engage in, in businesses that involve that close person-to-person -person contact in particular. Um, so I guess the theme here is, our view is that this will be a bit of a long and, and slow gradual return and that there will be a bit more pain to come for a number of months. Now, um, I just wanted to talk about this, this debt cliff. Um, and what we're, we wanted to highlight here, and I guess most of you on this call will probably be well aware of this already, but the thing that's concerning us at the moment, both for our own clients and the economy generally, is the government's done a, has done a tremendous job in being able to prevent what would have been you know, quite a disastrous outcome had they not have released all of the different support measures. If you go back to where we talked about in panic phase, you know, we had a lot of our clients or contacts that we were talking to um, really had a risk of insolvency in, in a very short period of time. And these businesses are businesses that are really good businesses generally. Um, and the, the only reason for the, the position they were in was COVID-19. Now, we've been able to then relieve that pressure by a series of measures. So we've got, you can defer your ATO debts, you've been able to refer your payroll tax debts, but these deferrals are generally about six months. Um, Bank debts have been able to have been deferred. Some banks have only done three months, I know, but other most banks, as I understand it, talking to customers, have been willing to give up to six months. And what we're hearing is there's been a fairly um, blanket, a fairly blanket approach to how they give those restrictions, and that there's probably not a lot of due diligence being done around the underlying position of those businesses. Um, and that's the same for all these measures. Um, other than possibly landlords and tenants, where we are seeing in the market that landlords are being a, a little bit more prescriptive and are requiring tenants to be able to, to demonstrate the financial impact on them. But again, the landlord-tenant code of conduct, that's only got a six month period of time. Um, part of the government measures, support measures also included a insolvent trading moratorium. Now that again had six months and that, that was also a big reason that a lot of our initial um, discussions around things like safe harbour or solvency well, a lot of those went away because directors took some comfort in that. Um, we should probably point out though that 
our view is that just because you have an insolvent trading moratorium, it doesn't mean that you, you're risk-free as a director. Um, there's still other duties that directors have to abide by, sections of 180, 181, 182 of the Corps Act, um, which effectively fiduciary duties. And if you recklessly trade your business insolvently, while well, you might not be able to be prosecuted for insolvent trading in this period, you more than likely could be prosecuted for some of those other breaches. Um, JobKeeper is another massive one. And while this is a cash flow inflow, it, it obviously stops in six months. So all the while, the majority of these, um, while they all give a cash flow benefit right now, all of them expire in about six months. And so two things happen. Um, either you lose the cash flow, you lose, lose the cash flow benefit, um, or, and this is in most cases, you not only lose the cash flow benefit, but you then actually have to start repaying these liabilities. And when we get to September, and I suspect in the months leading into that, there is a real risk that depending on how the economy has responded and how quickly we've opened up restrictions and how quickly we've started to return to normality, that a lot of these businesses that have accumulated material debt in this period, while they've been able to get through from a cash flow perspective, there's a real risk that they will suffer some pain or, or some difficulty as a minimum in being able to meet their obligations once they get into that period. So for the bankers on this call, um, what we would encourage you to be doing is to, as we move forward, be pretty close to those clients that have been impacted in this way and encourage them to be able to, to be able to be looking ahead several months to be able to understand how they're going to deal with those, those different liabilities as they come into play. Because what we have seen in this period is a lot of goodwill among supply chains, governments, financiers. So I suspect that as long as people continue to operate in the context of that goodwill and they, and they forward plan and they are proactive about dealing with, with all of their creditors that they're going to have to start paying, including banks, then they will likely continue to enjoy that support. But pre-planning and being able to get on the front foot with those key stakeholders is going to be really critical, um, especially as we sort of move forward over the next couple of months. The way back long and slow. As Sean's touched on, recovery will be recovery will be gradual and, and there will be setbacks um, through health or, or just general business response. Um, our messaging both internally and externally through this process has been that businesses need to engage with their stakeholders and develop a plan. And this is where we think the original safe harbour legislation still is very useful to directors in that it encourages them to engage with external advisors, develop a plan, develop key milestones and adjust that plan as factors change. Um, so that will cover them off not in relation to insolvent trading but we also believe that if a director is developing that course of action that they'll be, they'll be in a pretty strong position to cover off their fiduciary duties which, which Sean's touched on earlier. Um, businesses need to, I guess, understand that the debt cliff is coming, um, accept it, but start planning on how they're going to deal with any, any balloon debt um, by, again, engaging with, engaging with stakeholders and considering what, what options are available. All right. Um, so, look, we'll just recap quickly. And if you've got any questions, um, feel free to start typing those into the, into the chat panel. But um, so, lots of really rapid changes in a short period of time of seeing a, a scenario and an environment that effectively we've we've never seen in our lives and um, it's a real positive I think the way that the Australian community and economically as a country we've responded to it um, but there are risks that are going to remain for some for some time and those that are in high risk industries obviously are going to have to manage the process really carefully both in terms of pr pr um, protecting themselves from the the potential that they could get a, a, an infection within their own community that could impact their business, as well as dealing with the financial impacts that they're already having to having to respond to. This sort of debt cliff we talked about in September of 2020 is a really critical juncture, um, and we think that there needs to be some really proactive planning around that in advance. Um, and I think provided that we get that planning in advance, I think that we'll be able to get positive outcomes in most cases, but there will be some businesses whose business model or balance sheet was such or is such that they will have to go through some sort of restructuring or insolvency process. So I, that's pretty much the end of, of what we wanted to cover. Um, we've just got a little bit of time for questions at the moment. 
got a couple that have come through that we'll go through. Um, the first one was what do we think is going to happen at the end of this at the end of this period? And I think we've sort of covered this through the presentation, but um, just to reiterate, and sorry, the question more specifically was around when JobKeeper goes away. Um, JobKeeper is doing two things at the moment. It's keeping people employed that were otherwise stood down, and it's also allowing businesses to have some cash flow relief where they are continuing to employ people. Um, so there's going to be two impacts that I see. When we get to the end of the JobKeeper scenario, um, subject to what has happened within the economy, we may in fact um, we may in fact see that a lot of those employees that have been stood down will then become made redundant um, if there's not actually sufficient business revenues to be able to fund them. But that will then create a whole other problem because if you need to make those employees redundant en masse, well, there's a significant cash flow impact to that. So I think that's something that we're going to have to watch pretty closely. Um, the other side, obviously, is some of these businesses will be relying on JobKeeper to trade through. And what we're going to need to see is some of those, those businesses that are accepting JobKeeper, we need to see them seeing an uptake in their revenues accordingly and being really closely managing their, their margins. Um, another question we've got here is around um, how do we safe har see safe harbour being relevant as we move forward? Um, this is an interesting one. So I think Charles touched on it too. We, we think safe harbour is still relevant um, because the reality is it creates a really good opportunity and structure to do a formal restructuring. It brings all your parties, it brings all your information and parties together through an external advisor who can give you an independent point of view. It also forces you to actually take steps to make sure that you're in a better position than if you than if you did. Um, however, I guess what I would say is that while we've got this insolvent trading moratorium, I don't think directors are going to take it up. Is, is what we're seeing. We think they probably would, would well advise to, but I suspect where we're going to see things really change is when we get probably to around about June, July. And directors start looking forward and seeing, hey, you know, we're about to run out of some of these measures. We're about to have to start to repay some of these debts we've accumulated. Um, if they start to then have concerns around solvency, I think they're going to need to reach out around safe harbour at that time. And given how quickly we saw people looking at it as a viable tool in what we called earlier the panic phase, um, I think that there's enough, there's enough. Um, visibility of safe harbour in the general business community now, that it will be a, a genuine tool to help work through some of this. Just got another question here. At this stage, when relief measures end, there will be businesses that decide to close and go into external administration. Given community aversion to insolvency coming out of the Royal Commission, does BDO think they should engage with the reader to start right narrative that some appointments will be unavoidable. Um, good question. Look, I think we saw in the AFR yesterday there was a, a piece written by the insolvency reporter Matt Cranston and he chronicled that very point in that it's certainly not expected that he was talking about the fact that banks are likely to look at how they deal with troubled loans differently going forward. Um, and if you read through the commentary they, they interviewed a number of insolvency practitioners and all of those insolvency practitioners including um, the leader of our own business restructuring team, Andrew Fielding, who was quoted in that article, all of them suggested that um, the reality is that there will be a certain degree of insolvency, but I think what's going to happen is that on the other side of this, they will be different than what it looked like post the GFC. Um, we don't expect banks will necessarily be making those appointments. There might be some where they need to but we think more likely we're going to see more voluntary administrations as it's directors that actually start to get concerned first. Um, so look, I, I think the narrative will probably naturally start to evolve insofar as we will start to see um, a different conversation as time passes. And right now it's all been about, hey, let's work together, let's keep everything positive. Um, but as we move forward and businesses start to experience more pain, I think we'll naturally see a, a shift in the narrative, narrative anyway. And it's going to be unfortunate, but reality that some businesses will fail. And I think the community will understand that to a degree. Um, although I don't think there's a lot of appetite for it, you know, a widespread series of corporate failures. And, and certainly the bankers on this call 
um, I have no doubt that there will be an expectation within the community um, for you guys to be able to pick up some of the pain there. Um, I'm not suggesting that that's fair or the right way to go, but I, just reading the tea leaves, that that's what I would expect that we'll, we'll see in the narrative as well. All right, look, I think that's all the questions we've got and we're right on our 945, which is good timing. So I just wanted to briefly touch on, before I say goodbye, we're gonna run these webinars for about um, three or four weeks. We're gonna try and focus on giving you some real life insights around what we're seeing and, and rather than just technical updates, hopefully some discussions and insights to client discussions that we're having. So next week, we're gonna run another one of these. Um, this time, Darren Stacey, who's the head of our debt advisory team, um, he's going to be running that session. Darren's been having a lot of discussions with clients and contacts around debt, around the finance structures. And those discussions were prior to this COVID-19 through it and obviously on the other side of it. So he's going to give us some really interesting insights around some of those questions that clients are going to be asking of their lenders going forward um, and hopefully give you some insights around things that are relevant to the day-to-day -day, um, impact on your businesses. So thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate your time. Um, we know it's precious. Um, thank you very much. Thank you everyone.